Hi, good morning, everyone. It looks like we still have a couple folks trickling in. So just hang tight for just another minute and we'll get started here. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to ARCA's learning session on the new report titled Voluntary Resilience Standards and Assessment of the Emerging Market for Resilience in the Built Environment. This webinar is being organized by the Alliance of Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation, or ARCA, in partnership with Meister Consultant Group. My name is Julia Kim, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. So I'll start off with a brief overview of ARCA and then um, onto our featured presentation on the key findings from the new report, and then we'll wrap up with participant Q&A. So everyone will be muted except for our panelists, and due to the large number of participants, we ask that you type your question into the question box. And please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the webinar. When it's time for the Q&A portion, I'll be summarizing the questions submitted. Um, and uh, we'll be facilitating Q&A with our panelists. And feel free to use this question module if you encounter any technical difficulties, if you have trouble hearing any of our panelists speaking. Um, and then any questions that we're not able to get to, we'll ask our presenters to respond after the webinar, and we'll be sharing their responses in a follow-up email. This webinar is also being recorded, and the video will be made available on our website as well as the presentation, um, and we'll also share that directly um, in an email as follow-up. So about ARCA, ARCA is a network of leading regional collaboratives from across California that work together to advance adaptation statewide and increase local capacity to build community resilience. Our current membership of regional collaboratives cover the Sierra Nevada region, the Sacramento Capital region, the San Francisco Bay Area, the Los Angeles region, and the San Diego region. The Central Coast Climate Collaborative is also uh, will also be joining ARCA in the coming months. And then we're also working to engage the North Coast Resource Partnership, as well as additional stakeholders in the Inland Empire and Orange County and the San Joaquin Valley. The Local Government Commission serves as the coordinator for ARCA, and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research is an ex officio member on the Executive Committee, serving as a critical channel between key state agencies and local and regional entities. We also have a number of affiliate members, and if you're interested in joining ARCA, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, my contact information will be shared after, um, after the webinar. So ARCA is working to create a strong peer-to-peer -peer network of adaptation practitioners across the state and to and working towards formalizing mechanisms to exchange knowledge and tools. And as I previously mentioned, we also support emerging regional collaboratives by providing targeted guidance and resources. And as we have grown and evolved throughout the years, we're focusing our attention on bridge, bridging the planning to adaptation, sorry, planning to implementation gap and strengthening the urban rural connection as well as on equitable adaptation practices. Um, so to introduce our presenters, we're really excited to be joined by Kaylee and Catherine. Kaylee Whitehouse is a consultant at Meister Consultants Group, focusing on climate resilience, renewable energy, and strategic planning. Kaylee also supports a range of research projects on energy efficiency and resiliency in the commercial building sector and has supported content development for workshops and study tours focused on renewable energy and climate change. Kaylee has supported the U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot Initiative Soul Smart Program by providing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to municipal governments to fulfill designation criteria in the areas of zoning, permitting, and community engagement. Previously, she worked in corporate sustainability at Cone Communications, helping to identify potential nonprofit partners that would support CSR strategies around clean water. Kelly also held a fellowship with the Nature Conservancy of Massachusetts, supporting their policy research on green infrastructure and stormwater management. Kelly received her MBA and an MPP in 2015 from the Heller School at Brandeis University with a focus in social entrepreneurship and impact management. And her capstone project focused on analyzing state and federal policies to build resilience and improve recovery from flooding events. And she also holds a BA from the University of Vermont. And then we'll later be joined by Catherine Wright, 
who works with clients on projects which sit at the intersection of climate adaptation and mitigation. Ms. Wright currently leads MCG's work on the Smart DG Hub for Resilient Solar, which aims to increase the energy resilience of New York City through increased solar and storage deployment in partnership with the City University of New York and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Ms. Wright is a member of the Technical Assistance Team for the Clean Energy Solutions Center Ask an Expert Program and the U.S. Department of Energy Soul Smart Program. She also serves on the steering committee of the National Adaptation Forum and is a lead, lead green associate. She received a graduate degree from the Yale, Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where she focused on industrial ecology and energy. Um, thanks so much to you both for joining us today, and I'll pass it over to you. Great, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, we're so excited to be here today to discuss the Voluntary Resilience Standards Assessment and the current market for resilience standards, guidelines, planning documents, and certification systems that exist in the market for the built environment. Um, so my name is Kaylee Whitehouse, and um, today I'm joined by my colleague, Catherine Wright. We were lead authors on this report, which was funded by the Kresge, the Energy, and the Bar Foundations. And we work at Meister Consultants Group, a sustainability consulting firm located in Boston. We were actually recently acquired by your affiliate Cadmus Group, um, which is why there are two emails listed there for both of us. Um, our, primary, our work primarily focuses on climate adaptation and resilience as it relates to commercial buildings, the electric grid, and municipal planning. So today on the webinar, we are going to walk through our methodology and process for creating the final report. Um, we're going to discuss the framework we use to understand what tools and guidelines currently exist on the market and identify meaningful points of comparison between them. Um, we will walk through the reports that we reviewed um, and discuss overall market positioning and the state of the current market for resilience standards. Lastly, we'll discuss some key takeaways and the next steps needed to move uh, the market forward. And just a quick note, um, throughout this presentation, we will be referring to the various guidelines, frameworks, tools, collectively as standards um, for simplicity's sake. There are many nuances to this term since many of the standards we reviewed did not actually set benchmarks or criteria, but were actually tools um, to help assess risk. So the research process for this report was conducted in 2016. We assembled an advisory committee of experts in the resilience space and with expertise in resiliency or green building frameworks. In this time, we conducted desk research, reviewing each of the standards on the market, conducted stakeholder interviews with 22 representatives involved in the development of resilience standards, the deployment of resilience initiatives, or the management of facilities that incorporate resilience features. The team held, four, uh, person, held a four-person focus group um, consisting of industry association representatives three members who were either facilities managers or advisors. And through this process, we identified opportunities, levers, and strategies to help drive market adoption of resilience standards and assess barriers or gaps that currently exist within the market. So as you can see, we identified a variety of standards and guidelines um, aimed at increasing resilience of the built environment hazards and events. Some of these were focused on addressing one specific aspect of the built environment or one specific system. We termed this the facility scale standards. Um, and then there were those that aimed at addressing a variety of pieces of infrastructure or systems at once. Um, and for simplicity, we um, address those as community scale standards. So through our desk research, we created a framework to help evaluate each of the standards. Um, with the target audience category, the framework compares standards based on facility type, 
such as residential, commercial, industrial, industrial or municipal. We also um, looked at the scale of focus, so whether it was at the facility level or addressed it at the community level. The life cycle phase at which the standard applies, so is the standard meant for new construction or existing facilities? And whether the standard considers systems beyond the site level, so does it consider things such as communication infrastructure or transportation? And within the impact and scope category, the framework compares the hazards included within the standard, such as flooding, wind, earthquakes, um, whether it has performance goals, such as business continuity or passive survivability, and whether the standard incorporates social vulnerability. And so within these performance goals, passive survivability refers to the ability to maintain critical life supporting functions, such as the regulation of temperature, access to water and electricity during and after uh, when an event occurs, often for a specified period of time. And then finally, the standard development process category um, really considered whether the creation of the standard was community or ind industry driven and whether the standard was verified uh, through an internal process or external review. And so at a broad level, um, you can kind of see the robustness of what we looked at um, when we were looking at each of these um, different frameworks and standards. Um, so we're going to next walk through kind of what we found on each standard um, and how it fit within the evaluative framework. So the first standard um, that we're going to walk through is the Building Resilience um, in Los Angeles framework, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, so the Building Resilience LA Primer for facilities was released by the USGBC LA chapter in 2016. This primer focuses on resilience in terms of capacity building and education for existing facilities. The guide outlines a process for incorporating resilience into operations, initiating institution, institutional changes required to support preparedness planning. And USGBCLA is currently working with the uh, Los Angeles private sector, community organizations, and nonprofits to pilot the program. It's one of the few planning processes that focuses specifically on existing buildings within the current market. So looking at below at the comparative framework, um, you can see that it's specific to um, facilities at the facility scale, um, it can apply to both retrofits and new um, construction. And it aims to build community-wide resilience as an end goal, um, but systems outside the facility are not included. And it can be used to address a variety of hazards that are identified through the planning process. And it's focused on building adaptive capacity, emphasizing the importance of social vulnerability and addressing that within the standard. The next tool that um, we looked at was the Insurance Council of Australia's Building Resilience Rating Tool. Um, so the Insurance Council of Australia is an industry association of insurance providers um, that developed a web-based uh, tool as part of its larger program on resilience. So a simplified version of the hazard rating assessment it's a simplified version of the hazard rating assessment used by insurers within Australia, and it's now in its second beta release and is available for testing by insurers and other interested parties. So it relies on publicly available data sets and user submitted information. The hazard rating tool focuses on minimizing damage to homes from disasters. It's currently limited to single family homes within its usage. So again, kind of looking at the comparative framework, it's specific to the residential facility. Um, it's for existing buildings um, and it identifies specific hazards um, such as uh, wildfires, wind, hail, and flood. Um, and it has performance goals of minimizing damage. So 
So Envision was developed by the Institute for Sustainable Infrastructure and the Zofnest Program for Sustainable Infrastructure at Harvard. Envision is a rating system for public infrastructure projects in the realms of transportation, waste, water, energy, information systems, and landscapes. Envision provides guidance during project planning, design, construction, operation, and deconstruction, and offers a process and tools for evaluating and rating projects of different sizes and types based on their community, environmental, and economic benefits. And it's, it's important to note here that um, this has currently been adopted by Los Angeles for public works projects to help understand the resilience of them. Um, so again, looking at the comparative framework, it's meant for public works projects, so that's the facility type. The scale is the community-wide um, life cycle. It can apply to both uh, new and existing projects and it considers outside systems. Um, and then it has a holistic framework for identifying hazards and encompasses um, some optional components around social vulnerability. So the Fortified program was developed by the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. It offers three different programs currently, Fortified Home, Fortified Commercial, and Fortified for a Safer Business. So the main program is Fortified Home, which is designed for new and existing construction and focuses on the protection of homes from hurricanes, high winds, hail, and severe thunderstorms. Under Fortified Home Program, developers of new construction projects or owners of existing homes complete a self-assessment which is then reviewed by a third party evaluator. The Fortified Commercial Program, which is designed for new or existing buildings, began in 2014 in hurricane prone areas. It addresses hurricane and tropical storm hazards. In non hurricane areas, it addresses high winds and hail. And then lastly, Fortified for Safer Business began in 2011 and is a code plus program for small and mid sized businesses constructing new facilities. Hazards included our floods, freezing weather, hail, high winds, hurricanes, water intrusion, wildfires, earthquakes, and interior damage from fire and water. This, uh, the Fortified for Safer Business is still within a pilot phase. So the lead pilot credits on resilient design, um, they were initially uh, put um, in the lead guidance in 2015. Um, they were designed to complement the existing lead program and they were available alongside the other credits in building design and construction rating systems. So there are three types of credits um, released during that pilot phase. The first required climate change assessment or emergency planning. The second required design for the top three hazards relevant to an area, such as flooding, hurricanes, high winds, or earthquakes. And the third required passive design for survivability, such as backup power, access to potable water, and thermal resilience. So within specific hazard areas, Lee drew upon um, other standards for guidance, such as the Fortified for Safer Business and the Resilience-Based Earthquake Design Initiative, which I'll discuss a bit later. Um, so USGBC is currently updating the lead pilots for uh, resilient design, so they are not currently available within the lead framework, um, but it's estimated that they will come out soon. The Performance Excellence in Electricity Renewal Program is a third-party certification program designed to measure and improve power system performance for campuses, including large buildings, cities and towns, and electricity supply projects. So it's administered by the Green Building Certification um, uh, Incorporated, and it was developed by EPRI and Motorola after the 2003 blackout in New York City. 
So peer helps establish um, energy professionals and or work with energy professionals to evaluate power generation, transmission, and distribution systems based on four different outcome-based categories and associated credits. Um, these credits include reliability and resilience, energy efficiency and environment, operational effectiveness, and customer contribution. And so the certification begins with an independent assessment of a project, which provides a roadmap and business framework for using PEER. PEER also offers a toolkit to enhance project development and design and foster continuous improvement. So as you can see um, in the um, evaluative framework, um, it's meant to be used at the commercial or campus level. Um, and the scale is very specific to one system, which is the electric grid. Um, it's life cycle, it can be used to address new construction and existing projects. Um, and doesn't really include any other outside systems apart from the electric grid. So the hazards that it really wants to address are the power outages, and then it has performance goals around improving power performance. It also has, um, it was driven by the industry, um, kind of driven by the New York City blackout, and then it has an external verification process. So the resiliency action list um, otherwise known as RELI, was developed as a national consensus standard um, through an ANSI-approved process, and it began piloting in 2015. Um, RELI provides a comprehensive process for incorporating resilience into new building design and planning. The program is structured similarly to LEED, using lists of credits and prerequisites that draw on existing standards. So it can be applied to homes, businesses, infrastructure, districts, neighborhoods, and campuses. It is one of the most comprehensive new building standards reviewed, combining principles of resiliency and sustainability at the building and the community levels. Um, so RELI is also designed to be an underwriting standard known as the Green and Resilient Property Underwriting and Finance Standard which if adopted would amend the green building investment underwriting standards currently applied to commercial buildings. Realize standard quantifies the tangible value from resilience investments to reduce costs of capital and financing and support underwriting for bonds and mortgages for resilience. So the Realize framework is currently, is currently administered by Perkins and Will. Um, it was created by Doug Pierce um, who works there, um, and it has a list of more than 60 actions uh, focused on facility planning, design, operations, and maintenance. And it references uh, many of the standards that are on the market, including Fortified and Envision um, within it. And then the Resilience-Based Earthquake Design Initiative, or Ready Rating System, was developed by AIRUP and is now uh, is applicable to areas facing earthquakes or other seismic hazards, including coastal areas at risk for tsunamis. Um, so the program focuses on beyond code design, planning, and assessment to help facilities, organizations, and communities recover quickly after a seismic event. This approach is in contrast to the traditional emphasis on protecting the lives of building occupants. So really looking at uh, building functionality. Ready has a silver, gold, and platinum level objectives for resilient earthquake design um, with ratings based on downtime after an event, um, such as time for reoccupancy and functional recovery. Um, the standard also offers guidance on engaging stakeholders in planning and developing a formal resilience plan. And so while Ready does not directly assess climate, address climate change and use hazards, some of its processes and methodologies can be applied to climate resilience planning. And as you can see on the comparative framework, um, it really addresses the facility scale. It's for uh, new construction. 
um, and it's specific to seismic hazards. It also incorporates performance goals, um, including building reoccupancy and recovery, um, and it's been industry driven. So the Sustainable Sites Initiative offers a comprehensive um, rating system for developing sustainable landscapes. The American Society of Landscape Architects Fund, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center at the University of Texas, and the United States Botanic Gardens develops the sites program. Because it focuses on projects from a land development the development perspective sites provides uh, guidance to landscape architects, engineers, um, but does not address buildings specifically. The system is administ uh, administered by GBCI and was tested through two year pilot program starting in 2009. So, sites is designed to be pursued in conjunction with uh, the LEED program. Um, and like LEED, SITES has four certification levels in separate categories for commercial, retail, office areas, and corporate campuses. Credit categories can include pre-design assessment and planning, water, soil, and vegetation, material selection, human health and well-being, construction and operations, and education and performance monitoring. Some of the site's ratings categories overlap with other resilience standards, particularly in the realms of site selection and design, managing on-site precipitation, supporting social connections and site accessibility, providing on-site safety in food production, and reducing heat island effects and using appropriate plants. So the Enterprise uh, Community Partners, a financial lender to affordable housing projects, administers the Enterprise, Enterprise Green Community Certification Program, which is designed for both new construction and existing buildings. The certification criteria were mostly, most recently updated in 2015 and are available to any facility with affordable housing units. So as part of the certification criteria, the Green Communities Program requires the adoption of a resilient design feature that improves performance um, in response to extreme weather events and power outages. It also includes uh, an optional credit for conducting a vulnerability assessment, which must include the consideration of climate projections. And then to complement the certification program, Enterprise Community Partners developed the Ready to Respond Toolkit which focuses on resilience. And the toolkit provides guidance for staffing and operating multifamily housing during disasters, as well as guidance on resilience retrofits for existing facilities. Enterprise uh, Partners is also piloting a series of resilience readiness assessments of existing multifamily facilities in New York City. So in addition to the facility scale standards we just discussed, there are also community scale standards which are intended to address multiple systems at once. Uh, the majority of these are currently within the development phase. These include the Anchor Program, which is aimed at calculating a, re a resilience benchmark for communities. The ICCR, which is aimed at understanding the governance and chain of reliance of systems within a community and the Community Resilience Assessment Program, which looks at infrastructure resilience to identify a, a gauge of overall uh, community preparedness. And the Unified Facilities Criteria are currently used by military installations across the U.S. and consider hazards such as climate-induced hazards and others. So during our research, we found that standards varied in two key ways, the scale of focus and whether they provided technical or holistic guidance. So in terms of the scale of focus, some standards were focused on hardening the built environment at the facility level, 
Um, so you can see this on the x-axis. Uh, community scale standards address resilience at the district scale, and they identify and assess vulnerabilities of core community services and systems and offer guidelines for holistically addressing preparedness. Standards with a technical focus, um, now moving to the y-axis, offer an in-depth guidance that is um, specific to certain hazards, but rarely offer a holistic approach to other aspects of community resilience. So for example, the PEER standard, which is located up in the left-hand quadrant, um, focuses on the reliability and the resilience of electrical infrastructure. And many technically oriented standards focus on segments or sub-segments of buildings, though a minority actually consider campuses. Holistic standards address multiple hazards or resilience challenges, offering guidance for the assessment of vulnerabilities and providing resources for improving preparedness. Vulnerability assessments are a cornerstone of many of today's resilience standards, including RELI, LEED, and the Enterprise Green Community Certification. So we also identified that the standards apply to facilities at different times in the building cycle. The standards under uh, neighborhood and community focus on multiple systems and do not necessarily fall within one area of the building life cycle. And then in contrast to the chart, the majority of these standards are actually focused on new construction, but provide additional considerations, technical standards, or actions that can be implemented for operations and maintenance during the performance life of the facility. Very few standards are focused on resilience as it relates to existing facilities. The exceptions to this are the Building Resilience Tool in Australia and uh, the Building Resilience Los Angeles project. Currently in beta testing, the Australian um, tool was um, providing homeowners with scorecards and suggestions for retrofits, which may reduce premiums. Um, and the Los Angeles uh, initiative provides guidance on integrating resilience into operations and delivers training programs for building staff. Um, and then as part of the Enterprise Green Communities Program, they, they created the Ready to Respond Toolkit, which I mentioned, um, which provides guidance on resiliency for retrofits, but has not been um, fully integrated into their current certification program. And then as, um, as we went through this process, we found that some of the key takeaways from um, our research and what we were hearing through our interview process and focus group is that the market is still emerging. Um, so many of the standards um, that we reviewed are still in the pilot programs or they're working with their first sets of customers. Um, the value proposition is not yet clear for facilities. So facilities managers are unsure what incentives are out there or what tools are out there for them to access and what the return on investment is for, those in, um, for um, resiliency work. And then, Proactive facility managers and property owners are unsure where to start. So again, having access to the tools um, and understanding what resilient standards are out there and what will help them best. And so through the interviews and focus groups, several people voiced potential pathways um, to increase the adoption of resilient standards. These include um, some of the following um, that you can see on the left-hand side. The big ones included looking at local policies, so um, looking at developing pathways to streamline local policies, and state and local policymakers can use a range of policies to help drive market adoption um, for resilience standards and encourage market growth. Um, some of the ones that were noted were including uh, building codes beyond code policies, zoning and permitting, incentives, and financing programs. Um, so specifically, building codes can drive market adoption and help open financial markets for resilience investments. 
Integrating resilience standards into building codes is particularly relevant for cities that have control over their own codes outside of statewide le legislation. And then beyond code policies may be able may enable uh, local governments to take action on resilience, particularly in states where local governments don't control their building codes. Additionally, um, it was mentioned that revised zoning and permitting ordinances can encourage resilience and help bolster the market by drawing on the content of resilience standards and offering incentives for certification. And again, related to local policy, uh, many, uh, many people express the lack of incentives for adoption of resilience standards. So local policies that uh, recommend resiliency practices can help build cre credibility for financiers and lenders, and incentive programs in the market could include tax benefits, grants, lower development fees, or other financial incentives. And then some other areas where there was, um, where we made recommendations for moving the market forward included simplifying and streamlining the resilience standards that are currently out there. Some of the current standards out on the market already uh, cross-reference each other and there's, there might be a way to uh, more fully integrate them into one uh, main standard. Additionally, uh, demonstrating the return on investment of resilience in, uh, investments may, uh, many participants acknowledge that there was a lack of cost benefit analysis on the investment, in, on investment in resilience and standards developers are beginning to work on this. Fortified, for instance, has a testing facility to explore the effects of high winds and hail on, hail on buildings. And then education and outreach is needed about existing standards that are on the market. So many facilities developers were unaware of some of the standards and even standards developers did not know what was on, currently on the market. And then lastly, you can um, read the full report on the MCG website on Meister Consultants Group. Um, and then feel free to reach out to myself or Catherine with any additional questions. Great. Thanks so much, Kaylee. That was really quite informative. And for participants, I'll, I'll be sure to share um, the link to the report out as follow-up. And I encourage everyone to submit any questions that you have by using the question portal in the GoToWebinar um, module. We have a couple questions coming in. Um, so I know this study really focused on the built environment, but do you know if there are any plans for an assessment of emerging markets for um, resilience standards focused on the natural environment and targeting specific ecosystems? Um, hi, this is Catherine. Um, uh, so at least uh, in terms of next steps for our particular stream of research, we are working on a localized report that's focused on the city of Boston that will be released later this month, but we sort of haven't gotten any direction, at least from the funders that we work with in terms of next steps. Um, I do think it's a really important need. Um, we did recently do some work with EDF on sort of sustainable infrastructure and that touched a little bit on sort of the standards and sort of uh, next steps that need to be done in order to sort of strengthen the market for sustainable infrastructure and ecosystem services. but. Um, in terms of the kind of group that we were working at, we don't, we don't have any kind of further steps beyond the built environment at this time, but I do agree that it's very important and a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and I would also point to the SITES initiative um, as one that's focused kind of on working with nature and valuing some, some ecosystem services. Um, Envision might also be one that could potentially move towards um, being more inclusive of that as well. Great, thank you. And I know you already noted that there really aren't many incentives that are provided through these standards, but in your research, have you seen, seen you know, a couple or any more innovative incentives that these tools and organizations provide? Um, so this is Catherine, and there's a couple of uh, innovative policies at the state level, but these are mostly concentrated in the southeast. 
Um, Kaylee might be able to give you the specific list of states, but in those cases, um, they were offering insurance breaks for residential homes that could demonstrate that they met the fortified standards. So that that was sort of some pretty leading edge policy. Kaylee, do you recall what yeah. states? Yes, yeah, so that was in Alabama and Mississippi. Fortified homes are eligible for insurance discounts um, in certain counties. And then also there's grant funding available for retrofits um, under the Strengthen Alabama Homes Program. Um, and then in Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, um, Fortified Homes receives uh, wind mitigation credits through the state's wind pool as well. Yeah, so those are some state level examples. Um, the, the Insurance Council of Australia's goal for the building resilience and rating tool is to use scorecards coming out of those tools to eventually lead to insurance breaks. And then at the local level, there's been they're not quite incentives, but there's certainly guidance that has been released by New York City. Um, and then there's um, guidance that is being revised by Boston that's focused on uh, for new construction. It's essentially a checklist that facilities have to uh, provide the city with a sense of how they're preparing for climate change. Um, Boston's guidance didn't used to be very prescriptive, but they're in the process of updating it. In fact, the update might be available publicly now. Um, from the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Um, and it's essentially much more prescriptive in terms of they've set specific sea level rise and temperature targets um, and offer a lot more suggestions for facilities. But again, that this only, um, these are more guidelines rather than uh, say incentives, um, but the city certainly is trying to encourage folks um, to take more of these resilience investments into account. And that's some of the ways in which they are doing so. Great, thank you. And I know the standards that you reviewed are primarily focused around building resilience, but have you found anything around disaster response? So just in light of all the hurricanes and currently the fires that we're experiencing and really throughout California are quite devastating. And uh, just wanted to hear from you if, there, if, there, if there's anything related to dis disaster response and recovery and the standards that you've reviewed or if there are additional assessments that you found related to that? Yeah. The, that's certainly not core to the standards that we reviewed. Some of them do have credits um, and guidance on coming up with operational plans and emergency management plans and having those emergency management plans be responsive to um, local hazards and changes and hazards that might occur due to climate change. Um, I'd say that's about as far as most of them take it. Um, yeah, and in some cases, they, I mean, they have thresholds for passive survivability um, and things for withstanding dur during an event. Um, but then they also, some, some of them have optional credits related. I think the RELAC program has optional credits related to sheltering in place and providing community-wide shelter. Um, but apart from that, nothing in terms of disaster response. So drilling down um, in closer detail, can you share a bit more about, you know, at what cost these fortifications are being implemented and, if, and what specific building codes they're based on? Sorry, the first part of the question was about the cost of certification? Of the fortifications. Oh, of the fortifications. Okay, um, so the standards are not necessarily, necessarily prescriptive about the type, the costs of the specific technologies, um, and that's certainly not covered in this report. I could, I can refer you, however, to a previous project that I worked on called the Building Resilience Toolkit, which was completed for uh, the buildings in Boston, in which we took a look at some of the major climate vulnerabilities and matched available technologies, including their cost, uh, providers, and applications. Um, so that's also a link that we can send along. Um, and it, so it certainly provides the cost of what some of the fortifications, uh, what you might expect. Um, so that project was done for the Northeast. So it's not going to cover all the hazards. So for example, like uh, it, I'm pretty sure it's uh, 
stormwater management flooding and uh, the urban heat island effects. So we certainly don't have anything uh, in that particular toolkit about fires, but I think it it's, can provide a helpful framework um, to give you a sense of what the cost of some of the technologies might be. Um, in terms of the building codes, um, so sort of each each of the standards is, is different in terms of um, how they were developed. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, they had expert-driven processes where folks that were on some of the code councils were integrated into the process of setting some of the standard framework. Um, for example, in Reddy's case, there was a lot of interaction between um, the main expert who led the Reddy process is also part of the national seismic code conversations, and so he was pretty much able to go back and forth. But they they're all have sort of different frames of reference. Um, and in the in the report itself, we sort of break out and we have a detailed appendix on that describes each of the standards and talks a little bit more about sort of the process and the basis for each one. Perfect. And if you could share a link with me um, for the Building Resilience Toolkit you mentioned, I'm already getting a couple questions from folks requesting that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, will, I will do that now. No worries. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And then across the board, just looking at all of the standards, um, what were some of the common measurements and metrics that were used to uh, really measure resilience? Okay. Um, so uh, I, I say, I say it, it certainly depends on the standard because some of them, the basis upon which they're they operate is that the facility sort of begins to conduct their own hazard assessment. So not all of them are necessarily as, as prescriptive in terms of prescribing metrics. Some that I'd say are cross-cutting or passive survivability standards are referenced across a few of them. Um, there are some that are focused on sort of um, the availability of backup power and backup power duration is also a uh, metric that is cross-cutting across a few standards. Um, Ready in particular is pretty is pretty focused on your ability to occupy the building. There's also some metrics around downtime um, and business continuity um, that I also think are I would point to as being fairly consistent. Um, but partly because of uh, what I think Kaylee pointed out in some of the uh, market positioning images uh, that we have from the report, like um, there are some of the standards that are more holistic are less focused on prescribing metrics because they think that facilities will arrive at different conclusions about what their primary vulnerability or hazards are. Um, and so sometimes they're, so that in that sense, it's a little bit harder since some of the standards are, are quite different from one another. But those couple that I named are, are some that I, uh, recall are across several different ones. Great. Thanks, Catherine. So, with a constant influx of new data and new models and projections around climate change, the baseline for climate is changing. So, how are the risk baselines established and what are some of the tools that are used to establish these baselines? Um, so, I think, I think Kaylee mentioned this in some of her commentary that not all of the standards have a strong climate basis. Um, and, I, and that was one of the things that um, surprised us um, about the study is that not all of them necessarily rely on climate projections. There are quite a few that rely on the FEMA maps. So as those are updated, the standards perceptions of risk are updated. But as I'm sure a lot of you on the phone are aware, the FEMA maps are backward looking and we use historical data as opposed to projections. Um, so in terms of, um, so that that's not necessarily the level of risk that a facility might find appropriate if they're really trying to plan for climate change. Um, so like I said, some of them are tied to baselines or reference standards that as they're up, updated, the standards will update, but not all of them actually rely on local climate projection data. Um, some of the more holistic standards do require that facilities uh, conduct a vulnerability assessment. Some of them are prescriptive um, and do 
suggest that climate change be included within those assessments, um, but not all of these standards actually have um, climate projections uh, as their base, which we found surprising. Um, yeah, and then I, I think to second that, it, a lot of the standards have that more holistic approach of assessing um, specific standards that might be um, specific to an area, or, or not standards, but um, hazards specific to an area. So with that, you also have uh, changing data and they aren't necessarily pointing you to the specific resource that you should use, but saying that you should look at different projections for your area in terms of uh, risks. So it, it's not necessarily telling um, everyone to look at the same data um, to establish that resilience baseline or that risk baseline. Um, but it's definitely a little bit more holistic and open-ended. Um, and then, so what is clear is that there is a need for some sort of global documentation structure that looks at all hazards and allows different organizations to input their requirements or adopt others without recreating. This is not unlike the building code alignment of the 1980s, so how can we make this happen for resilience? Yeah, I think I think that's a great question and one we're wrestling with ourselves. Um, and we we are having a small start um, at Green Build next month. Um, so even through the process of conducting interviews for this report um, and a lot of the experts that are working on these different standards, taking a look at the interview list. Um, sometimes that list and the table uh, that is in the report with all the standards was the first time a lot of them were hearing about one another and they hadn't connected before. Um, so there's been sort of a, a small uh, community that's been built out of this report and we're actually going to have sort of a, the first of, I'm sure, a series of conversations, a small conversation um, coming up at Greenville 2017 um, just to kind of continue the dialogue. Um, but I think a really important first step was just sort of mapping what's out there because um, in terms of the recipients of the standards, the facilities and the campuses that we want to be using these standards, like they weren't aware of everything that exists. I and mean, the experts themselves sometimes weren't aware of all the different resources that were out there. So I, I think that's a, a first step. And then, yeah, I definitely do think that there's some standardization um, that we need to move the market forward. I think we have time for just a couple more questions, so folks feel free to um, send, a, send a few more in. Um, so we have primarily local government staff who are participating on this call, a lot of cities and counties and special districts as well. Was there one set of standards that really jumped out at you that you were surprised by and impressed by? Um, so for folks who might have limited time, they can review this, re review your report, but if they wanted to drill down into, you know, one or two of the standards, were there any that you would recommend? Um, I, I would say it kind of depends on what the local government is looking for. So what I recommend is to just take a look at the summary table we put together and it's kind of organized. So like if, if, if for example, your local government is really focused on um, like social, social vulnerability and the connection between climate change, there's really only a few standards that are going to probably meet that criteria. Um, and if you take a look at our chart, that'd be enterprise, green communities, and rely. And if there's certain other standards, uh, certain other hazards that you're really focused on. You can also use that chart to sort of drill down to one or two um, that might meet your interests. So I, I would suggest starting starting there and just taking a quick scan, it only take you two or three minutes, and then you should you'll probably get a sense of which of the standards best matches your priority areas. I think this question might be a little outside of the scope of this specific study, but perhaps there are other studies that you might be able to point us to. Um, so the question asks, will you be studying the cost to rebuild where a disaster has already occurred and study if um, study if the, the area is rebuilt in the same way or if resilient measures are, are used instead? Um, that's that's certainly beyond the scope of this study, um, but I, as I do know, and as Kaylee mentioned, there's a few organizations that are really trying to look into the sort of avoided costs of using some of these technologies. Um, so the National Institute for Building Sciences is one, 
Um, Fortified actually has a testing facility that's also taking a look at this. Enterprise um, Green Communities is also taking a look at this as well. Yeah, so there certainly is work that's being done by all of those organizations to try and quantify the avoided costs so that a lot of these technologies, it's like very clear that they should be used in rebuilding and recovery efforts. Um, and yeah, so those are the ones that I can think of that are, are moving in that vein, but it was outside of the scope of our research for this particular project. I think we have time for one more question, and Tappan, you might have already mentioned this, but in the standards that you reviewed, do, do they point to funding opportunities that can be utilized? No, no, they, no, they don't. Um, that would be lovely. Um, um, they, they don't point to funding opportunities, um, but uh, I, I can, I can at least speak to some of what we've been seeing going on on the East Coast, um, and also some in California. Um, I know that some of the PACE programs are adapting so that resilience investments can be included. That certainly has been the case in Florida and the rank and, and, and sort of things that mitigate wind and hurricane damage. And I think there's been some efforts in San Francisco as well in terms of seismic ret retrofits. Um, and then there's also, I think, been a number of sort of uh, community resilience grant opportunities that have come out um, at the state and regional planning council level that could realistically be applied to fortification of, of facilities. So unfortunately, the standards themselves don't go as far as suggesting funding sources, but um, I, there, there are a few opportunities that we reference in the paper that are emerging. Great. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today. It was really informative hearing about this new report, and I'm sure folks will be folks are eager to uh, dive deeper into them. Any final thoughts to share? Um, well, thank you for having us. We're really um, glad that we could share and then, um, share this, some of our findings with you. And please feel free, feel free to reach out to Kaylee or myself. Great. Thank you both so much. And thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. Um, again, as Catherine mentioned, feel free to reach out to either Kaylee or Catherine directly. Their emails are provided up here on the screen and we'll share it as follow up as well. Um, as a reminder, the webinar recording and the presentations will be shared by email and also posted on ARCA's website. And we're currently planning a learning session with the Climate Justice Working Group on their recently released recommendations for integrating equity into adaptation work. So please stay tuned for more information. And that concludes this webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.